In her recent The Watchman's Rattle, subtitled Thinking Our Way Out of Extinction, Rebecca Costa delivers a fascinating account of how civilizations die. Their problems become too complex. Societies reach what she calls a cognitive threshold. They simply can't chart a path from the present to the future. The example she gives is of the Mayans. For a period of three and a half thousand years between 2600 BCE and 900 CE, they developed an extraordinary civilization spreading over what today is Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador and Belize, with an estimated population in those days of 15 million people. Not only were they master potters, weavers, architects and farmers, they developed an intricate cylindrical calendar system with celestial charts to track the movements of the stars and predict weather patterns. They had a, their own unique form of writing, as well as an advanced mathematical system. Most impressively, they developed a water supply infrastructure involving a complex network of reservoirs, canals, dams, and levees. Then suddenly, for reasons we don't still fully understand, the entire system collapsed. Sometime between the middle of the 8th and 9th century, the majority of the Mayan people simply disappeared. There have been many theories as to why it happened. It may have been prolonged drought, overpopulation, internecine wars, a devastating epidemic, food shortages, or a combination of these and other factors. One way or another, having survived for 35 centuries, Mayan civilization failed and became extinct. Rebecca Costa's argument is that whatever the causes of the Mayan collapse, it, like the fall of the Roman Empire and the fall of the Khmer Empire of 13th century Cambodia, happened because problems just became too many and complicated for people of that time and place to solve. There was cognitive overload, a kind of collective burnout, and systems broke down. It can happen to any civilization. It may, she says, be happening to ours. The first sign of breakdown is gridlock. Instead of dealing with what everyone can see are major problems, people continue as usual and simply pass on their problems to the next generation. The second sign is a retreat into the irrational. Since people can no longer cope with the facts, they take refuge in religious consolations. The Mayans took to offering sacrifices on a major scale. Archaeologists have uncovered gruesome evidence of human sacrifice on a, a really vast scale. It seems that, unable to cope with their problems rationally, the Mayans focused on placating the gods by manically making offerings to them. So, apparently, did the Khmer, which makes the case of Jews and Judaism fascinating because they too faced two centuries of crisis under Roman rule between Pompey's conquest in 63 BCE and the collapse of Bar Kokhba rebellion in 135 CE. They were hopelessly factionalized long before the great rebellion against Rome and the destruction of the Second Temple. Jews were expecting some major cataclysm. What is remarkable is that they didn't focus obsessively on sacrifices like the Mayans or the Khmer. Instead, they focused on finding substitutes for sacrifice. One was Gimilat Chasadim, acts of kindness. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai comforted Rabbi Yoshua, who wondered how Israel would atone for its sins without sacrifice, with the words, My son, we have another atonement as effective as this. Acts of kindness. As it is written in Hosea, I desire kindness, not sacrifice. Another substitute was Torah study. The sages interpreted Malachi's words in every place offerings are presented to my name to refer to scholars who study the laws of sacrifice. The Gemara in Tanis says one who recites the order of sacrifices is as if he brought them. Yet another substitute was prayer. Hosea had said, take words with you and return to the Lord. We'll offer our lips instead of the sacrifices of bulls, implying that words could take the place of sacrifice. So the Yushalmi says, he who prays in the house of prayer is as if he brought a pure oblation. Yet another was tshuva. 
The psalm says, the sacrifices of God are a contrite spirit. From this the sages inferred that if a person repents, it's accounted to him as if he had gone up to Jerusalem and built the temple and the altar and offered on it all the sacrifices ordained in the Torah. A fifth substitute was fasting. Since going without your food diminishes a person's fat and blood, it counted as a substitute for the fat and the blood of the sacrifice. A sixth was achnasat orachim, hospitality. As long as the temple stood, said the sages, the altar atoned for Israel, but now a person's table atones for him, and so on. What is striking in hindsight is how, rather than clinging obsessively to the past, sages like Rabbi Yochan and Ben Zakkai thought forward to a worst-case scenario future. The great question raised by Tzav, which is all about different kinds of sacrifices, not why were the sacrifices commanded in the first place, but rather, given how central they were to the religious life of Israel in Temple times, how on earth did Judaism survive without them? The short answer is that overwhelmingly the prophets, the sages, and the Jewish thinkers of later ages realized that sacrifices were symbolic enactments of processes of mind, heart, and deed that could be expressed in other ways as well. We can encounter the will of God by Torah study. We can engage in the service of God by prayer. We can make financial sacrifice by charity. We can create sacred fellowship by hospitality, and so on. Jews didn't abandon the past. We still refer constantly to the sacrifices in our prayers, but neither did they cling to the past. They didn't take refuge in irrationality. They thought through the future and created institutions like the synagogue and the house of study and the school that could be built anywhere and sustain Jewish identity, even in the most adverse conditions. Now, that is no small achievement. The world's greatest civilizations have all in time become extinct except Judaism which always survived now in one sense that was surely divine providence but in another it was the foresight of people like Rabbi Yochan and Ben Zakkai who resisted cognitive breakdown created solutions today for the problems of tomorrow who did not seek refuge in the irrational and who quietly built the Jewish future. Surely there is a lesson here for the Jewish people today. Plan generations ahead. Think at least 25 years into the future. Contemplate worst-case scenarios. Ask what we would do if. What saved the Jewish people was their ability, despite their deep and abiding faith, never to let go of rational thought and despite their loyalty to the past, to keep planning for the future. Shabbat Shalom.